On Virginity de Virginitate by St. Ambrose, translated by Albany J. Christi, 1817-1891. to Chapter 1. The Objectors Really Worldly and Tempters In what age of the church has not this judgment been celebrated? Two women came to the king and stood before him, 1 Kings 3. One had overlaid her child in the night, and it had died and she claimed the other's son as hers. How was the king to judge the secrets of their hearts, for evidence on either side was none? He commanded a sword to be brought, the living child to be divided, and half given to one and half to the other. She who was not the mother assented and pressed the execution of the sentence. The other, whose bowels yearned upon her son, and whose love for him was greater than her desire to possess him, said, O oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. And so Solomon, though unable to read the heart by divine intelligence, through his wisdom pronounced her to be the mother, and the other one as void of natural affection as she was of piety. Thus, though for a time obscured, the truth finally was discovered. The real mother was long kept in suspense, but at last the uncertainty was dispelled, and... This is written in a figure for our learning, that we may know that there is nothing hid which shall not be brought to light, or secret which shall not be revealed. By the two women are signified faith and temptation. When the latter has forfeited its own fruit by sinful living and sloth, she endeavors to rob faith of her offspring. While the cause is pending, faith is perplexed. At length the sword of Christ brings to light the hidden affections, that sword of which it is written, I am come to send a sword upon the earth, St. Matthew 10.34, and again, A sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, St. Luke 2.35. And it is described thus, The word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow. Hebrews 4.12 A good sword is the word of God, there is none like it. It searches the heart and reigns, and discerns truth from falsehood, piercing the soul not to its destruction, but to its salvation. Such is the history recorded in the book of Kings, such its moral lesson and spiritual application. Let us now attend to the history of Jephthah. It will teach us the obligation of vows. End of chapter 1 Of vows in general, they are scriptural and binding when made for holy purposes. Jephthah, Judges 11, was one of the judges of Israel. Fearful of the doubtful event of a war, he vowed that in case of victory he would offer for a burnt offering to the god of battles whatever first came forth of the doors of his house to meet him. He was conqueror and smote the enemy, and on his return his daughter, who knew not of his vow, in duteous haste came forth to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And when he saw her, he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. And she said to him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. She only begged for a respite of two months, that she might bewail her virginity upon the mountains. At the end of the two months she returned to her father, who fulfilled the vow. Though Holy Scripture indeed passes on in silence, in abhorrence of the crime. God forbid that we should praise the act of Jephthah. At the same time his fear of breaking his vow was right. As it was said to Abraham, Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Genesis 22.12 a promise, therefore, must not be rashly broken. Yet the same passage in the patriarch's life proves God's hatred of Jephthah's crime, in that a ram was substituted for Isaac and offered up for the burnt offering. Jephthah, therefore, must have known that God delighteth not in human blood, for in the divine announcement made to Abraham he might have learnt that while God's service must take precedence of parental affections, yet parents should consecrate their offspring to God, not slay them. Strange that the daughter should so much have tendered her father's vow, and he not hesitated to slay his child. 
she been careful of her father's truth, he careless of his daughter's death. But why did God in this case permit the crime, and prevent it in the former? Is he a respecter of persons? No, but of holiness and virtue. The reason is plain. God withheld Abraham from a crime, and his doing so indicated his will. It supplied the example which future ages were bound to follow. Perhaps, too, the difference of merit contributed to the difference in the event. The father rent his clothes, the daughter bewailed. Both questioned God's mercy. Abraham lamented not. No sooner did he hear the divine command than he forgot he was a father, deferred not the sacrifice, but hastened to obey. Isaac hesitated not while following his father, wept not while being bound, begged for no respite when ready to be sacrificed. Where faith was more obedient, mercy was more abundant. Isaac fulfilled the interpretation of his name, Genesis 21.6. He rejoiced in being offered to God, and was rewarded by deliverance. He was neither doubtful of God's mercy, nor anxious of his own sacrifice. But in the case of Jephthah, there was none to arrest his hand. The cruel murder of his daughter was only a counterpart to his own demerit. End of chapter 2 Of the Particular Vow of Chastity a sacrifice of human blood is offered, and no man opposes. The oblation of chastity is made, and behold objectors. One father's vow can only be paid with blood, and it is paid. Another vows the virginity of his daughter, and men grudge the loving and religious oblation. The daughter in tears offers her blood to fulfill her father's vow. Another may neither for parents' love nor self-devotion willingly perform the religious vow and God's priests are blamed for maintaining the sacredness of the promise. Yet did St. John Baptist condemn unlawful wedlock, and is it not the same conduct as his that is blamed in them? What was the occasion of his passion and martyrdom but his words, It is not lawful for thee to have her? St. Matthew 14.4 Why, but because she was another man's wife? And how much more truly may this be said of a virgin consecrated to God? He rebuked a king. Are not others to be rebuked? We have no Herod, blessed be God, but the world is as erodious. May no word be uttered for virginity? It is written, Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, Isaiah 1.17. And that God is a father of the fatherless, and a judge of the widows, Psalm 67, 5. Are we then to abandon, yea, or condemn the holy virgins? Even among heathens virginity was respected. Though no religious merit was possible for them, or interior purity, yet the virginity of the flesh was had in honor. Shall pagan rites be graced by virgins, and virginity be excluded from the church of God? They were virgins by constraint, uninstructed in its merit. With us priests are bound to teach it, and yet men would forbid it. Privileges with them compensated for renouncing wedlock. Must our maidens be constrained to marry? The pagan priest used force to fill the number of the vestals. Are we to use force against the profession of chastity? Rather, let our priest endure the worst than fail to magnify the oblation of purity. Consider that they were virgins who, in preference to apostles, first saw the resurrection of the Lord. They were virgins who sat over against the sepulchre, the new sepulchre, as St. John calls it, or, as St. Matthew, the new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And it was a new tomb, lest it might be said that another and not Christ was risen. It was the tomb of just Joseph, for Christ rises from the dead in the new affections of the just. It was not the Lord's own tomb. For he who conquered death needed not a tomb of his own. Such do those only need who are dead under the law. Mary then saw the resurrection. She first saw and believed. Mary Magdalene too saw, though not all free from doubt. End of chapter 3 Bodily chastity without faith and inward purity unprofitable. And take heed, ye virgins, lest ye too, like her, doubt of the resurrection of the Lord. 
virginity of the flesh is no merit without integrity of the soul. St. Mary Magdalene was forbid to touch the Lord, for her faith still wavered. St. John 20. She touched Christ, who touched him by faith. Mary Magdalene stood without at the sepulchre weeping. She sees not Christ's body and thinks it's lost, and because she stands without, she weeps. St. Peter and St. John ran and entered in. They wept not, but went away rejoicing. Because she went not in, she wept, believed not, and thought him taken away. Nay, she believed not when she saw the angels who asked her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Words repeated by the Lord, that we may know that angels speak, but what the Lord commands them. Our Lord repeated the words, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Woman, in sign of want of faith, for he that believes rises to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Woman, in reproach not of her sex, but of the slowness of her faith. And note that the woman still wavered when the virgin had believed. Why weepest thou? Thou art thyself the cause of thy weeping. Thou weepest as not seeing Christ. Believe, and thou shalt see him. He is here. He is never far away from such as seek him. Why weepest thou? There needs not tears, but ready faith. Cease from earthly thoughts. Forget the passing things of time, and thou shalt have no cause to weep. Why weepest thou, where others joy? Whom seekest thou? Dost thou not see that Christ is here? Seest thou not that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, that Christ is sanctity, Christ is chastity, Christ is perfectness, that Christ is born of a virgin, of the Father, and with the Father, and ever in the Father, begotten, not made, unchangeable, ever beloved, very God of very God? They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Woman, Thou errest in thinking that Christ has been taken away, and not rather raised by his own power. No man has taken away the power of God, the wisdom of God, his adorable chastity. Christ is not taken away from the monument of the just, from the secret soul and holy thoughts of the virgin devoted to him. None can take him thence, though they would. Mary, look on me. Before he called her woman, now she begins to turn to Christ, he calls her by the name of her who bore him, Mary. It is the soul that spiritually beareth Christ. Look on me. Whoso looks on Christ receives amendment. While he sees not Christ, he goes astray. She turned and looked on him, and said, Rabbi, which is to say, Master, whoso looks on Christ, turns toward him, beholds him, and seeing him advances toward perfection. So now him whom she believed dead, she addresses and calls Master. He answered, Touch me not. Thou art but a beginner, thou still art wavering. Touch me not. Touch not the power of God, the wisdom of God, his adorable perfectness and purity. But go to my brethren, weep no more without. Go to my elect, my most diligent priests, and say to them, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. Move now no further question. Go to the more perfect, and they shall tell thee how he is my father and how yours. Mine by divine generation, yours by adoption. My father, he says, distinguishing himself from creatures. Your father, indicating the grace of spiritual adoption. And of him who naturally is his father, he says, according to the mysterious sacrament of the incarnation, to my God, adding, and your God, in sign of his mighty working in us, which floweth from that mystery. End of chapter 4 The fewness of those who possess this grace. For he has most truly become our God, since the passion of our Lord, since which time virginity has become a boon more precious than life itself. If any object, we must be patient, they, as we, are under grace. With them, then, we would be at peace, but their objections must be refuted. We accuse them not, but by their clamor they are their own accusers. Oh, that the praises of virginity were seconded by examples of holy virginity! We complain not that our words are accused. 
we lament that there is so little ground in fact for the accusation. Would that the charge could be proved against us by instances, and not clamor of mere words raised against us. The accusation is a praise, how little do we deserve it. Maidens, by holy mysteries, initiated and consecrated to perpetual chastity, may not be borne away from the holy altar. Are maidens, whom the world allows to choose their husbands, to be hindered if they prefer Almighty God to wedlock? Oh, that rather the betrothed could be recalled, and change the wedding raiment for the religious veil of chastity. Blessed are the priests who sow the seeds of purity, and inspire their flocks with the desire of virginity. End of chapter 5 Holy virginity, neither blameworthy nor unscriptural. Is their doing so either blameworthy, a novelty, or inexpedient? If it be blameworthy, so are all our prayers for a blessed resurrection, so is the life of angels, whom in the resurrection we shall resemble. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. St. Matthew 22.30 Such a state is proposed as our reward. Can then its likeness upon earth be blameworthy? while the reality is the fruit and object of our prayers? Or is it a novelty? If so, if Christ taught it not, who to the faithful is the way, we rightly abhor it and condemn it. But what saith the Lord? There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. St. Matthew 19.12 Surely that is a noble warfare, which is for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And great, therefore, is the praise our Lord has bestowed on unspotted purity. If it is so excellent, we may say with the apostles, If the case of a man be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. They deemed the yoke of wedlock heavy, and chose before it the grace of purity. But the Lord knew that while all praise it, few could practice it, and he answered, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. It is a thing allowed, not in condescension to our infirmity, but as a counsel of perfection, and so, after he had said, There be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he added, He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Directly after these words, there were brought unto him little children, that by his blessing they, hitherto unspotted, might retain their purity. And of such is the kingdom of heaven, of such as through ignorance of corruption, return, as it were, to childhood, with all its chastity. See how virginity is praised by a voice from heaven, even by our Lord? Mark well the teaching of our divine Savior. No sooner had he forbidden the severance of wedlock, save for fornication, than he made mention of the gift of chastity, teaching us that holy wedlock is good, but that virginity is better that he strays far from the truth who condemns the former, yet is no less unreasonable if he shuts his eyes to its disadvantages. For the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. 1 Corinthians 7.34 Though in marrying she sin not, yet she shall have trouble in the flesh, sharp are the pains of childbirth, and wearisome the bringing up of children. These, however, must not sever those who are united. For the apostle has before said, Art thou bound, by the tie of mutual love, unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. The bonds of wedlock are therefore good, yet they are bonds. The marriage tie is good, yet it is a tie, a tie to the world. She careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Still, good as wedded love is, the severity of chastity is better than all its endearments. Nor is this strange. The outward act is often, to appearance, contradictory to the intention of the doer. Chastisement may proceed from the deepest affection, and an enemy may wear the guise of a friend. And so it is written, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Proverbs 27.6 St. Peter wounded, Judas kissed. Poison was spread on the lips of one, and his kiss condemned him. Tears washed away the other's fault, and he rose more perfect. 
and even so the church joys in the wounds of chastity. Cantgirls 2, 5. Let not him, then, who chooseth wedlock, disparage virginity, nor let him who preferreth virginity condemn wedlock. Such as have done so, and dared to solve the marriage tie, holy church hath condemned long since. Hear her own words. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourisheth. Canticles 7, 11, and 12. Many a field bears fruit, but that is fairest which abounds no less in flowers. Such is the church's field. Here are tender buds of fresh virginity flowering at spring tide. There, in the plains of the wood, the gravity of serious widowhood. Elsewhere, the full harvest of faithful wedlock fills the granaries of the world, and the wedded vines make the presses of the Lord run over with abundance. End of chapter 6 Nor not inexpedient. Doubtfulness is no bar to it. Finally, is it inexpedient? The world is alarmed for itself, as though marriages are to be no more and the human race to be extinct. But what a need of terror! Has there ever in fact been a lack of persons willing to be brides? And as to ills arising from either state, broken wedlock has been the source of wars and destruction, but to none has consecrated virginity occasioned death, for it is higher than human law and beyond its sanctions. Religion gives it its dignity, and its safeguard is the faith. Nor is there fear of the extinction of mankind. Facts have proved the contrary, and shown that where virginity has been most honored, there most mankind has multiplied. What multitudes of virgins were yearly consecrated at Alexandria, in the African church, and throughout the east in the time of Ambrose. Births were rarer in the west than consecrations of virgins in the east. Even on this ground, then, let not virginity be thought unprofitable. Yea, how profitable has it been, seeing that by a virgin salvation came, to render fruitful the Roman world. If ye will urge this feudal argument, pause and see whether it will carry you. It will lead you to defend the violation of wedlock, if thereby mankind be more multiplied. The wedded need not be alarmed, they have their wives. For the unwedded man, whom has he to blame but himself if he seek a maiden who he knows beforehand not to be a bride? Fathers need not fear for if other maidens are consecrated, their daughters may be the sooner chosen. At least, one may say, let none be veiled too young. Nor is it denied that caution must be used by the priest, and no maid be veiled unwarily. He ought to regard her age, measured however by her faith and dread of evil. Let her love of purity be the measure of her years, her seriousness be counted for gray hairs, let him examine the gravity of her behavior, the ripeness of her modesty, and the incorruption of her spirit. Let him see that her mother, who is her guardian, be trustworthy, her companions discreet. Such an one is already grown gray in maidenhood. Years make not the difference but disposition. Youthfulness is no bar in itself. Years did not advance St. Thecla, but holiness. Each age is perfected in Christ, and can do God's service. Holiness is the substance. What matters is whether it be clad in the vest of childhood or old age. Innocents have suffered martyrdom. Why may not girls profess virginity? For it is written, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Psalm 8.2 Infancy followed Christ unto death. May not childhood follow him as far as continence? Children followed Christ in the desert, for there were women and children fed with the five loaves over and above the five thousand men. May not youthful virgins follow him to his kingdom? Forbid not, then, the little children to come to Christ. They suffered martyrdom for him, and of such is the kingdom of heaven. He calls them, Suffer them to come unto me. St. Matthew 19.14 And will you forbid? Forbid not the young maidens, of whom it is written, Therefore do the virgins love thee, and they brought thee into their mother's house. Canticles 1, 3, 
and eight too. Separate not those little ones from the love of Christ, whom they confessed while yet unborn, and leapt in their mother's womb for joy. End of chapter 7 When and where the Virgin must seek for Christ Time and place are but accidents. God's mercy is not limited to places. The Holy Virgin is pronounced blessed by the angel within a house, and David anointed for a prophet. Within doors, abroad on the way or in the desert, everywhere Christ heals. On the way the issue of blood was staunched. In an inner room, Jairus' daughter was raised to life, and in the desert the people sought him that he might heal them. Neither is any time too early to seek for Christ. It is written in St. Luke, When the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands, thus proving himself both God and man, on every one of them, and healed them. And when it was day, the people sought him. The setting sun and the darkness of night agree well with the pains and groans of the diseased, the daylight with the people's faith and the gladness of the healed. Heaviness may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. What greater joy, then, to follow Christ into solitude? Let those who devote themselves to Christ learn from his divine charity. He healed the sick in multitudes, and like him, let them withdraw into solitude and shun display. Let them, if they would, share in his healing mercy, withdraw from the city, from wantonness and luxury, and as he knew not softness, so let his followers dwell in the desert as in a hot sandy desert. Let them mortify their earthly frame. Let their bodies faint with hunger unappeased, and their lips be parched with unsatisfied thirst. We cannot seek Christ too soon. When the sun rose, the people sought him. Let not night overtake us, for he only departeth not from Christ who walks in the light. Let us then follow him in the daytime. Now is the church's day, which Abraham saw and was glad. At night he will not be found. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Think not that Christian maidens can serve their Lord equally in the world. He is not found in the crowd of men in the thronged thoroughfares. Thus speaks the church in the Song of Songs. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets, and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. She did not find him. I sought him, she says, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Let us not seek him where we shall fail to find him. He does not wander in the marketplace, for Christ is peace, but in the world is strife. Christ is righteousness, in the world is iniquity. Christ is energy, in the world is vacant sloth. Christ is charity, in the world is detraction. Christ is good faith, in the world is fraud and circumvention. Christ is in the church, in the world idolatry. And in the church the widow is righted, in the world she is oppressed. Shun, then, Christian virgins, the public walks, shun the places of public concourse, shun the hot ballroom, the worldly bazaar, the more worldly because hypocritical, the fashionable watering place, I, and the church, which should be God's house of prayer, but which is made the scene of man's display and man's idolatry, where Christ's little ones, the poor and wretched, cannot, for delicacy and pride exclude them, come to worship. Impurity lieth in wait in the public streets. Ponder the warning of the wise man in the book of Proverbs. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger that flattereth with her words. Proverbs 7, 4 through 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Woe to us if, when we seek him, we find him not, and woe to us if we seek him where we ought not. If we seek him in the houses or conventicles of the teachers of dissent and heresy, who falsely assume the name of teachers, if we seek him with self-will and not humbly in his church. 
Often is the church grievously wounded through this our willfulness. The watchmen, this is her own complaint, that went about the city found me, they smote me, they wounded me, the keepers of the walks took away my cloak from me. Let not, O virgins, our mothers suffer through our self-will. Let not our cloak, the garment of discretion, the symbol of endurance, how unlike the soft clothing of them who dwell in king's houses, be taken from us, the cloak of doctrine worn by Christ and left by him to his apostles, let it not be taken from thee. Only as he bids thee, give thy cloak also to him who shall take thy coat. Be ready to array the ignorant and naked in the vesture of thy discretion, and impart to him the symbol of thy master's doctrine. End of chapter 8 From whom the virgin must seek Christ, what she must be that he may seek her. Let us, Christian maidens, seek Christ where the church seeks him, on the mountains of fragrant smell, that is, from religious priests, who, living in exalted holiness, like hills whose tops are covered with sleep flowers, breathe forth the odor of perfection. Christ shuns the din of men, the busy marketplace, the public walks, the restless concourse. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. The wily adder, the snarling dog, the groveling earth-bound serpent his soul hateth. He dwells in the elevated heights of holiness. In such daughters of the church alone is his abode, who can say, We are unto God a sweet odor of Christ. There is an odor of death unto death, even in them that perish. In them is the odor of life unto life, who, with a quick and living faith, exhale the sweet-smelling odor of the resurrection, and risen with Christ, set their affection on things above. Blessed Joseph of Arimathea and St. Nicodemus were mountains of spices. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with spices. So also are all who believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. They too crowned the hilltop of true faith with the blossoms of holiness. Where then is Christ to be sought? In the heart and from the lips of his discreet and prudent ministers. But this is not all. How must we come prepared, that we may find him? We have seen that the people sought him in the desert, and he says himself, I am the rose of Sharon's plain, and the lily of the valleys, as the lily among thorns. He may be found in various places, and virgins blessed with various but all harmonious graces may find him. I am the rose of Sharon's plain. See how he loves the simple open-heartedness of a pure virgin soul, and the lily of the valleys, the emblem not of luxury, of pleasure, or of wantonness, but of simplicity and lowliness. As a lily among thorns, the flower of fragrant smell springs amid the roughness of sharp discipline, and from a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, yea, my God, thou lovest. This is, Christian maidens, the true wilderness and solitary place that shall be glad, the true desert that is bid rejoice and blossom as the rose. Isaiah 35, 1. In this wilderness is the good tree that bringeth forth good fruit, that spreads forth its arms in holy deeds, and whose head is God. Let us, the trees of the wood, send forth branches in like manner. For, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So may the church rejoice and be glad, and say, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Canticles 2.3 Yea, let her say, Joyful at the issue of our faith. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Canticles 2.4 Love cannot be where there is not faith. The three sureties of the church are faith, hope, and love. When hope has gone before, and the foundation of faith has been laid, the banner of love is lifted up, and holy church is made one in herself and with her Lord. End of chapter 9
the virgin must put off the flesh, that he may seek her. Ye have heard, daughters of the church, how ye are to seek Christ. Hear also how ye may deserve his search for you. Call then for the Holy Spirit with the church's prayer. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden, and eat his pleasant fruits. Canticles 4.16 and 5.1 The garden of the word is the soul that blossoms with the flowers of spring, that is, with Christian virtues, and his pleasant fruits are the fruits of holiness. Whether thou eat or drink, if thou call him, Christ is present, and saith, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Proverbs 9, 5 Ye, if thou sleep, he cometh to the door, and knocks. Often he comes, and puts in his hand by the hole of the door. Canticles 5, 4 Yet not to all, but only to the soul that can say, I put off my coat at night. Canticles 5.3 O Christian soul, ere Christ will come to thee, even as he put off the flesh, that for thy sake he might triumph over the principalities and powers of the world, so must thou, in the dark night of this life, put off the vest of the life of sense. Hear the spiritual meaning of the words of the virgin soul. I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have put off the deeds of the body of, and of earth, and, even though I would, I know not how to resume them. Shame forbids return to them, and virgin modesty, nay, memory fails me, for chastity of conversation by long continuance blots out the recollection of past impurity. I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? A twofold meaning is contained in the washing of the feet. It is a symbol of humility, as it is written, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash another's feet. St. John 13.14 And it is a mystery of the faith, as it is written, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. St. John 13.8 This was said to blessed Peter, How great need, then, have our feet of washing, and how careful must we be of soiling them, for of a second washing there is no promise. Holy Church saith not, I have washed my feet, how shall I again wash them? But how shall I defile them? And in agreement with the sensible figure, we must wash out all traces of begone defilement. Once Christian virgins, your feet defiled with sin, have been washed in the fount whose springs are in eternity, once cleansed in the sacramental mystery. Beware, lest they be soiled again by the uncleanness of desire, or polluted by the filthy mire of unchastened acts. Would ye learn how to secure them from defilement, hear the beloved psalmist. Our feet shall stand in thy gates, O Jerusalem. Psalm 122, 2 This Jerusalem is not the earthly, but the heavenly one. Hebrews 12, 22. The city of the living God and we plant our feet therein, as the Apostle teaches us, by having our conversation in heaven. Philippians 3.20 Living in constant virtue, righteous deeds, and living faith. End of chapter 10 Whoso thus liveth may say, My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the window, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved. Canticles 5.4 It is good that our inward parts be moved at the approach of the Lord. If the blessed Mary was moved when the angel came in to her, well, may we be moved when Christ comes to us. When God imparts his divine presence to us, our bodies forget the affections of sense, and our inward man is lost, and is as though it were not. Be thou also moved, holy maiden, and, as Israel, by God's command, ate the paschal lamb in haste. Exodus 12.11 Haste thou too, arise, open the door, for Christ is there and knocketh at the threshold. Canticles 5.2 If thou open, he will enter in, and the Father will enter with him.
Not only when he is entered does he leave a reward, he forestalls his entrance with a blessing. The soul is still thrilling, still in the darkness of the night is it feeling the walls of its house, still seeking for the door whereat Christ is standing, still loosing itself from the bonds of the flesh and the thraldom of the body. Christ is still knocking without when, it is written, my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Canticles 5.5 five. Myrrh, the fragrant odor of faith, drops from the hands of the chaste soul. That myrrh which was the offering of righteous Nicodemus, the master in Israel, who first had the grace to hear the mystery of the baptismal laver. St. John 3.1 and brought at the entombment a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight, and wound the spices in linen cloths with the body of the Lord. St. John 19.39 This offering was an emblem of the fragrancy of faith, wherewith the soul that begins to open the door to Christ and is buried with him in baptism receives, first of all, the grace of the Lord's burial, even burial without corruption. For how could the flesh of him, whose name is as ointment poured forth, see corruption or any smell of death pass over it? Yea, seasoned by the fragrant flower of divinity, and everlasting and ever green, it rose again. And in its resurrection our flesh too is raised by communication of the ointment poured forth. Canticles 1-2 This ointment that seasoneth all whereon it is poured, was indeed from all eternity, but it was with the Father and in the Father. Contained in heaven as in a vessel, it was shed only on angels and archangels. Then opened the Father his mouth and said, Lo, I have given thee for a covenant of the people. Isaiah 42.6 and 49.6 And for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. The sun came down, and all things were filled with the new odor of the word. The Father's heart uttered a good word. Psalm 45, one. The sun was the fragrant odor, and the Holy Ghost breathed it forth and shed himself abroad throughout the hearts of all. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Romans 5.5 5. This fragrant ointment, the incarnate sun, poured not forth at once, but confining it in his sacred body as in a vessel, he waited the appointed time. The Lord God, he saith, hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak in season. Isaiah 54. The hour came, he opened his mouth, virtue went out of him, and he poured forth the sweet savor of the ointment. It was poured forth upon the Jews, it was gathered by the Gentiles, it was poured forth in Judea, its fragrance spread throughout all lands. Herewith anointed, Holy Mary, the Blessed Virgin, conceived, the Blessed Virgin bare the odor of sweetness, the Son of God. This ointment was shed forth upon the waters, and endured them with the power of sanctifying. The three children were anointed with this ointment, and the fiery furnace bedewed them with cool moisture. Daniel 3.23 Herewith was Daniel anointed, and the lion's mouths were tamed, and their fierceness soothed. Daniel 6.22 Daily this ointment floweth and never faileth. Virgin, take thy vessel, draw near that thou mayest be filled with the ointment. Receive the precious ointment of spicanard, valued at three hundred pieces. Receive it without money and without price, freely given, that all may have it freely. Receive the anointing, Christian virgin. Judge not like Judas that it is poured forth for burial. Be thou buried with thy Lord, and be partaker in his entombment. See that Christ be buried in thee, so shalt thou, like him, not see corruption. Take heed to thy vessel, and close it fast, lest the ointment run out, and it be lost. Close it with the key of perpetual purity and unblemished virginity, with shamefacedness in speech, and lowliness and humility. Blessed art thou, pure virgin soul, if thou possess this ointment. For as she that had it said, I opened to my beloved, and he passed by, 
Canticles 5, 6, so shall thy beloved, the Lord Jesus, pass by into the inmost of thy soul. So shalt thou be privileged to partake of that which Simeon prophesied to the mother of thy God. A sword shall pass through thine own soul also. St. Luke 2, 35. For what else is that sword but the living word of God, a sharp and piercing sword, that penetrateth all earthly thoughts, yea, every barrier, and searcheth the inmost recesses of the heart? End of chapter 11. The Virgin Must Watch and Wait for Christ Meditate, thou pure one. I speak not to you, once washed in holy baptism, yet daughters of the world. I speak not to you, whose raiment, ill-befitting a Christian virgin, seems to indicate your greater wealth or higher rank in proportion to its unseemly exposure of that which made it modestly would hide. Christ loveth not the rustling of your silks, the splendor of your satins, your broidered hair, the glittering of your attire, your chains of gold, your necklaces and bracelets, your stomachers of sparkling gems and earrings of bright jewels, vanities of the evil one, slaves to whom ye spend upon these baubles the earthly substance whereof ye are God's unfaithful stewards for his church, and the church's poor, vanities which are sources of bickering and envy, jealousy, and strife. But thou, pure one, perchance of no exalted station, perchance of lowly birth, or child of poverty and worldly wretchedness, virgin not alone in body, but in the snowy whiteness of an untainted soul, since thou resemblest more the glorious church, that has not spot or wrinkle, who, in the Song of Psalms, holds intercourse with Christ, do thou, like her, on thy bed in the night season, seek in thy meditation him whom thy soul loveth, cease not to watch and hope for his appearing. If he seem to thee to tarry, arise. He seems to tarry because thou slumberest. He seems to tarry because thou ceasest to be instant in prayer. He seems to tarry because thou liftest not up thy voice in psalms. Devote the first fruits of thy vigils to Christ. Sacrifice the first fruits of thine actions to Christ. Hear his voice calling thee. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. Come with me from Lebanon. Look from the head of Amana. Canticles 4, 8, etc. What is Amana's stream, the stream of truth, save baptism, across whose flood thou passest to thy conflict with the world? And what its fountainhead, save Christ, whom, when thou hast apprehended, thou shalt look back and triumph on thy baffled foe? He hath separated thee from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards, that is, from the incursions of spiritual wickedness, the beauty of thy Christian graces is pleasant in his eyes. How much better, saith he, is the smell of thine ointments, that is, the fragrancy of thy virgin integrity, than all spices. The smell of thy garments is like the smell of the frankincense of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Seek from him, then, that the Holy Spirit may breathe on thee, may breathe upon thy bed and enhance the fragrancy of thy pure piety and spiritual grace. Surely he will hear and he will answer thee. I sleep, saith he, but my heart waketh. Canticles 5.2 Thou hearest his grace as he knocketh at the door. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. His love, because thou lovest, his dove, for as a dove thou art simple and harmless, his undefiled, for thou art a virgin. His head is filled with dew, as the dew of heaven at eventide allayeth the dryness the sun has caused, and cooleth the nightfall, so the dew of our Lord Jesus Christ fresheneth the thick darkness of this world with the moisture of life eternal. This is the head which the blazing heat of this world cannot parch, on him as man, the spirit was poured without measure. The sap of life could not be drained in him, so that he truly was the tree of life, ever flourishing, though under the scorching sun of this world's vanity. Therefore he calls himself a green tree, as in the Holy Gospel he saith, If they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? 
St. Luke 23.31. And the dew wherewith Christ's head is filled is more than enough to preserve itself from dryness. It drops besides on those that are his body. It drops in plenty, yet is never spent, and its full tide, though ever flowing, fails not. My locks, saith he, are filled with the drops of the night. Upon his head the razor came not. He is the prince of peace, and steel is the sign and implement of war. Therefore are his locks unshorn, and they are filled with the drops of the night, the meaning of which we have already seen, even the dew of the Holy Spirit, which refreshes the parched and weary soul, watering the dry and sun-baked soil, that it may bear flowers of virtue and fruits of holiness. But we must not haste too fast. His locks are, as of a holy Nazarite, unshorn. The razor hath not touched his sacred head. Yet how unlike the ringlets of the wanton daughters of fashion, dressed with crisping pins, curled and plaited with the hireling's art, divided hither and thither with minutest care, redolent with luxurious perfumes and scented oils, these are not ornaments but criminal devices. Not the modest headgear of the virtuous maiden, but impure allurements to unchaste thoughts and enticements of a soul, if not a body, the victim of prostitution. These haughty daughters of England, who walk with outstretched neck and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, despise the degraded and wretched woman who deceit has lured or agonizing poverty has driven from the paths of virtue, think you that their virtue would be proof if the fear of public infamy were withdrawn against the deed of sin, when now so many acts imply that the thought of sin is no stranger to their minds. His locks, unshorn, shine with the unction of all holy graces. This is the spiritual meaning of Samson's history. While the true Nazarite has his locks unshorn, he is invincible, but if he lose them, lose these Christian virtues, his strength falls prostrate, and when the tempter cries, The Philistines be upon thee, he finds the Lord departed from him. Seeing that all this is true, seek not to resume the coat of earthly deeds which thou hast once put off. Canticles 5.3 Neither think that carefulness is needless to avoid it, it often meets thine eyes, inviting thee to put it on, and it is often offered thee by spiritual wickedness. Forget how to put it on. So forget as not to know how to put it on again, even if thou wouldest at any time. And as thou hearest the Lord knocking at the door, in thrilling hope rise at the sound, unshackled from all affections of the body, as thou art rising, prepare thy inward soul with prayers, that thou mayst strive to rise from earth heavenwards, and to open the door of thy heart. As thou movest towards Christ, thy actions will breathe the odor of faith. As it is written, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh. Lift up thine hands and smell their fragrancy, follow, as it were, the scent of holiness in thine actions, with unwearied and ever-watchful alacrity. The sweet smell of thy right hand will gladden thee. All thy limbs, when thou risest, will be redolent with the fragrancy of the resurrection. And thy fingers will drop with myrrh, that is, thy spiritual deeds shall be perfumed with the grace of true faith. Thus then, O virgin, thou wilt take delight in thy inward self, Thou wilt be pleasant to thyself and lovely to thyself, and thou wilt begin to lose what sinners are ever feeling, that harassing vexation with thyself. The body and the world will lose their charms, and thy simplicity, divested of the cloak of sin and worldliness, will be thy happiness. If thou be such, then Christ desires thee. If thou be such, Christ hath chosen thee. Open then thy heart's door, and as he has promised, for he is faithful, he will enter in. Embrace him whom thou hast sought. Come near to him, and thou shalt be illuminated. Hold him, and treat him not to leave thee. Implore him not to depart. Otherwise he will go from thee, for the word of God runneth very swiftly. Lukewarmness cannot take him. Carelessness cannot hold him. Let thy soul wait upon him in his word. Press close upon his footsteps, for he quickly passeth by. 
Yet as the church saith, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Canticles 5, 6. Think not because he so soon leaveth thee, that therefore he is offended with thee. Thou callest, didst entreat him, and openest to him, yet he is gone, and why? To prove thee, and often he thus suffers us to be tempted. Call to mine also his words to the multitudes that besought him not to depart from them. He said, Two other cities also must I preach the word of God, for therefore am I sent. St. Luke 4.43 Still, if he seem to depart from thee, stand not idle, but go forth and again seek for him. And now that thou art a virgin devoted to God, fear no more, as thou must once have feared, those watchmen in their spiritual sense who patrol the world ready to apprehend all that wander there. Fear them no more as they go about the city. Fear no more the wounds, Canticles 5-7, which cannot hurt such as follow Christ. Let them arrest thy body, that is, take away thy natural life. What matters it? Christ is near thee. When thou hast found him, O, oh, learn where thou mayest abide with him, lest, through thy negligence, he quit thee. And if thou wilt learn this, hear the teaching of Holy Church. End of chapter 12 The virgin must watch her heart, her eye, her ear, her tongue. For who but Holy Church can teach thee how to retain Christ? Yea, she hath already taught thee, if thou wilt only hear her. She says, It was but a little that I passed from them, that is, from the persecutors, the evil powers of this world. But I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him, and would not let him go. Canticles 3, 4 How then is Christ held? Not by chains of violence, not by tightened ropes. He is bound by the ties of love, by spiritual cords, by affection of the heart. Wouldst thou too retain Christ, seek him perpetually, fear not punishment, fear not torments. Nay, thou mayest more surely find Christ when in the hands of persecutors. It was but a little, says the church, that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. No sooner shalt thou have passed from the persecutor's hands, that is, no sooner have so resisted the powers of the world as not to fall under them, than Christ will meet thee and will not suffer thee to be long tempted. Then may the virgin who thus seeks Christ and finds him say, I held him and would not let him go, until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. Canticles 3, 4 What is thy mother's house and her chamber but the secret chambers of thy inward nature? Keep carefully this house, cleanse the inner rooms of this house, that it may be uncontaminated and, unsoiled by the filthiness of a corrupt conscience, may grow up into a spiritual house joined together by the cornerstone, into a holy priesthood and dwelling of the Holy Ghost. No maiden who thus seeks Christ and thus entreats him shall be abandoned by him. Nay, far otherwise, he will often visit her, for he is with us even unto the end of the world. Thou hast heard, Christian maiden, how Christ is found and retained, even he who is the church's words, put in his hand by the hole of the window, Canticle 5, 4, by which window is meant that eye of the mind, that spiritual sight through which we see the works of Christ. And thus, O virgin, let Christ come to thee. Through this window let Christ put his hand to thee, and let the love of him, the word, displace all other, and alone possess thee. If thou wouldst have him do thus, prepare thyself, cleanse the windows of thy soul, and let no dust of sinful acts obscure them. Let not a virgin's eyes exhibit aught offensive or corrupt. Far from them be soft, unchastened blandishments, far from them the languishing allurements which separate from Christ. Nor let the ear, framed to receive holy instruction, be made a means of vanity. Why should a Christian's virgin's ear be pierced to carry brilliant pendants? It needs no meretricious ornaments. The only one is she seeks is this, to hear and listen to the wholesome precepts of her teachers. Learn, too, 
in the night time, that is, in the darkness of this world, to keep thy door, even the door of thy lips, closed to all save Christ. Yea, let him too, when he cometh, open it until he call thee. Is it not written, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed? Open not thy lips to vain gossiping. Nay, speak not on holy things unless with Christ. For what hast thou to do with others? Speak with Christ alone, with him only hold converse. If women are commanded, as it is written, to keep silence in the church, how much more are virgins and devout widows? The enemy of chastity is ever in wait to take advantage. A casual word may drop, which thou wouldst fain recall. Had the door of Eve's lips been kept by her fast closed, she had not given answer to the serpent's questions, and Adam had not been deceived. Death come in by the window. Jeremiah 9.21 By the mouth of Eve. Even so, by the mouth, death comes in, if thou speak either falsely, immodestly, wantonly, or unseasonably. Let then the doors of thy lips be closed, the threshold of thy voice be barred, then only to be unfastened when thou hearest the voice of God, and the word of God speaketh to thee. And so shall thy hands drop with myrrh, and thou shalt smell the fragrancy of baptismal grace. Dead with Christ to the elements of the world, buried with him, and wound in spices, thou shalt also rise with him from the dead. Why are your maxims still as though living in the world? Touch not, taste not, handle not what it has to offer, things which, while they are being used, tend to corruption. Colossians 2, 20, 21, etc. Chastity has not in common with corruption. Bury, therefore, all worldly and fleshly cares. Ye who are risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ is. And if ye seek Christ, ye see God the Father, for Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. The virgin that seeks Christ must shun the gaze of men, avoid the public streets and crowded walks. Let not her voice be shrill, let her gait be stayed, herself unheard, unseen. The apostle would have your converse all unearthly, yea, rising on spiritual wings almost beyond your nature, upwards to heaven. Set your affection, he says, on things above and not on things on the earth. And for that this cannot be while ye are yet imprisoned in the flesh, and the soul, while the body lives, is still bound any measure by its law, and cannot rise freely heavenwards, the holy apostle adds, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. If hid with Christ, let it not appear to the world, for Christ also is to the world dead, and lives to God. Thus, hast thou seen how Christ would have thee desire him. Not with vain talking mayest thou unclose thy lips, but to him alone. And when thou hast opened to him, he passeth through to the secret chambers of thy heart, and thy soul shall fail when he speaketh. Canticles 5, 6. Fail and find in the world no stay, but abide in Christ and rest in him. End of chapter 13. Angels will watch over the virgin. Again it is written, I sought him, but I could not find him. Canticles 5, 6. He will withdraw himself to try thee, to prove thy love. The keepers of the walls found me. Canticles 5, 6. We have already seen one interpretation of the watchmen, viz. the wicked who watch for the just and are permitted to trouble them, and who do indeed prevail against such as will not persevere. There is another and a more consoling interpretation. We read of a city whose gates are ever open. The gates of it shall not at all be shut by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Revelations 21.25 This, O virgin, is that Jerusalem, which is in heaven, wherein thou art already kept perfect and undefiled. For there in no wise entereth into it anything common. Revelations 21.27 Or unclean, and such is not chastity, such is not modesty. They are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelations 21.27 
If we have found this holy city, let us enter therein. Let us behold its light, its walls, its tribes, the foundations of its walls, and the watchmen thereof. But how enter therein? In this city is life, and there is one way to life, even Christ. Let us therefore follow Christ. The city is in heaven. How ascend thither? The evangelist teaches us in the revelations. The Spirit led me to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. Let us ascend in the Spirit, flesh cannot mount thither. Let us thus ascend towards heaven, that she may descend to us, who hath the glory of God, whose light is like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, that hath a wall great and high, and hath twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, and its wall hath twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Revelations 21, through 14 The apostles are the foundations of the heavenly city, and the cornerstone is Christ, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 2.21 The city hath the glory of God. Within, without, everywhere is God. Wherefore do ye too, holy virgins and all ye righteous, cherish unspotted chastity of soul, for ye are fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God. Ephesians 2.19 Then, shall ye inherit the dignity of your heavenly country, if ye seek Christ within the bounds of this holy city, whereunto ye enter by faith and the precious pearls. Revelations 21.21 21. Of holy deeds, illumined by the light of patriarchs, founded upon the apostles, and having your conversation amid angels. The keepers of the walls took away my cloak from me, as we are now meditating on the second sense of the keepers of the walls, there is a corresponding variety in the explanation of their taking away the cloak. Above, we saw that the cloak that was taken away from the wanderer in the marketplace and street signified the garment of discretion which is lost by mixing in the world. Here the angels take away the cloak, by which we are to learn that God is merciful to all, that many who are obliged to mix in worldly matters may still find Christ if they seek him continually. Oh, that we too may be partakers of grace with them, that they who earnestly seek him in the night-time, Canticles 3, 1, of worldly business, in the courts of law, or the busy mart, thus finding even in the world the city of our God, in the courthouse a type of the divine tribunal, and in the crowded streets a Christian brotherhood, who assemble at the supper of the Lord, such as these may meet the angels in the city of God, and be by them stripped of the cloak of earthly thoughts and earthly deeds. They may say with holy David, Lord, have I not remembered thee in my bed? Psalm 43, 7. And they follow his counsel. Ye that by night stand in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Psalm 120. Psalm 134, 2. Nay, not only are we led to see here on earth a figure of things above, our thoughts are raised to the heavenly city itself, the awful seat of everlasting justice, and to the streets which are watered with a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, of which it is written, Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Proverbs 5.16 here, if we seek Christ, we shall be found by the angels. To proceed, they smote me, they wounded me. There is a sword that wounds, but heals in wounding. The word of God is a good sword, and its strokes are health-giving. There is a wound which love inflicts, a sickness that harmeth not, as it is written, I am sick of love. Canticles 2, 5 And this is the sickness of the perfect virgin, whose sole desire and earnest longing is Christ. The wounds inflicted by the word of God are blessed, for the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. Rebecca was thus wounded and sick of love, 
when she left her parents to become the wife of Isaac. Genesis 24.58 So likewise was Rachel, who envied her sister and loved her husband. Genesis 31 She envied her sister's fruitfulness, for she was herself barren, a type of holy church, of whom it is written, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. Isaiah 54, 1. This, therefore, is the second sense of the words of the Song of Songs. The keepers, or the angels, strip the virgin of her cloak of mortality and earthly deeds, that in purest simplicity of soul she may seek Christ. So long as she is clad in the cloak of worldly wisdom, she cannot find him. Beware, saith blessed Paul, lest any man make a spoil of you through philosophy. Colossians 2, eight. When she is arrayed in simple purity, then she draws near to Christ the word, and finds him, and then shall she see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. St. Matthew 5.8 End of chapter 14 Her Lord shall give the affections of the virgin soul. Seek him, O virgin, yea, let us all seek him, men and women. The sexes of our souls are not different. With prayer and supplications let us call him to us, that like a fair south wind, Canticles 4.16, he may breathe upon us and blow upon our garden the freshening gale of the heavenly word, that breaks not the fruitful trees therein with rude blast, but gently moves them with its kindly breeze. The soul is, as it were, wedded to the body, whose more masculine and fervid heat it calms and tempers. And so it is written, My soul made me like the chariots of Amenadab. Canticles 6.12 The soul is, while joined to the body, as a chariot drawn by restive horses, and it looks for an Amenadab to rule them. Amenadab was the father of Nasun, the prince of the tribe of Judah. Numbers 1.7 and is a figure of Christ, the true prince of his people, who, as a charioteer, directs with the reins of his word the soul of the righteous, lest it be carried headlong by the fury of its steeds. These horses are the four passions of wrath, avarice, desire, fear. When these are harnessed to the soul and begin to draw it, it is bewildered. The corruptible body presseth down the soul. Wisdom 9.15 commits it, against its will, to the mercy of brute force, which whirls it violently in the eddy of worldly cares, till the fiery steeds are tamed by the power of the word. The word, like a skillful charioteer, would secure the soul, itself not liable to death, against the fearful tossing caused by its wild horses. First, he will check the rapidity of their course and rein them in by the curb of reason, then guard against the inequality of their motions, lest they get entangled, and one by its viciousness in fact, its lagging retard, or its restiveness throw into confusion the rest. The fretful horse at once endangers the chariot, and harasses his yoke fellow. His fretfulness the skillful charioteer allays by gentleness, and he who is figured here diverts his steeds from the winding road of air, and guides them to the open plain of truth. The upward course is safe, but the downhill road is perilous. At length their labors ended, the soul's affections, obedient to the yoke of the word, are brought to the manger of the Lord, where their food, no longer earthly, is that bread which came down from heaven. Smooth and unhampered are the wheels of this chariot, and free from all obstruction, and of them the prophet speaks when he says, The spirit of life was in the wheels. Ezekiel 120. End of chapter 15. Modesty and confidence needful for the virgin. But to return to the Song of Songs, the word of God is called to the Garden of Nuts, Canticles 611, emblems of the study of the prophets as well as of the grace bestowed on Christian priests, whose sore temptations are figured by the almond's bitterness, their toils by the hardness of its shell, their fruits of inward holiness by its hidden kernel. A like figure was the blossoming of Aaron's rod. It was in its own nature dead, 
but by a secret and divine power it brought forth buds, bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. Numbers 17.18 Let him, then, come down into his garden, gather the vintage of faith, receive the fragrant odors, find the spiritual food, and feast on the sweetness of our honey. As himself saith, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. Canticles 5.1 The sweet compound collected from the flowers of Christian holiness by the toil of those bees whose act of labor is in agreement with the wisdom which they preach is by holy church laid up in honeycombs it to be the food of Christ. Let us seek Christ, let us call him to us, for he is all in all to us. Is any soul diseased with sins of the body? Is any soul cramped, as it were, with an iron band of worldly desires? Is any yet imperfect, though pressing forward with earnest meditation? Is any perfect in manifold graces? Let all come to him, for all are in his power, and Christ is all things to us. Art thou wounded, and wouldst thou be healed? He is the physician. St. Matthew 19.12 Dost thou burn with fever? He is the refreshing fountain. Zechariah 13.1 Art thou pressed down with iniquity? He is righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Needest thou help? He is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 Fearest thou death? He is life. St. John 11.25 Desirest thou heaven? He is the way. St. John 14.6 Fliest thou darkness? He is light. St. John 1.9 Seekest thou food? He is the bread that came down from heaven. St. John 6.35 O taste, then, and see how gracious the Lord is. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 34.8 the woman that was plagued with an issue of blood trusted in him and immediately was healed, for she came to him in faith. Do thou too, daughter of the church, come with faith, and touch though but the border of his garment. The torrent of worldly pleasures that overfloweth like a flood shall be staunched and dried up by the heat of the sun of righteousness. The health-giving word, only approach in faith like her, take hold, with like devotion of the very fringe of his heavenly words, throw thyself trembling at the feet of thy Lord. And where are his feet, but where his body is? O faith richer than all treasures, O faith mightier than all bodily strength, more health-bringing than all physicians. She came near, she felt his power, she obtained her cure. Even as when the eye is brought to the light, it is enlightened before it sees, and the operation of the light anticipates the vision. A disease inveterate, incurable, that had baffled every invention of art, that had drained all her resources, is cured by merely touching the border of the garment. She was ashamed of being seen to approach him. Imitate, O virgin, her shamefacedness. She was confident in her faith. Take pattern by her devotion. Great, truly, was her grace. She desired to conceal herself, yet desired not to conceal her fault, for she seemed to have done presumptuously. Neither do thou conceal thy faults, which he already knoweth, but confess them. Be not ashamed of doing what prophets have ere now done, and not been ashamed. These are the words of Jeremiah, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed, words which express her meaning when she touched the fringe, as though she said, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Jeremiah 17.14 And none is really healed unless thou heal her. There may be some who will say to thee, as was said to Jeremiah, for often are the faithful thus tempted, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Jeremiah 17.15 Yea, to the Lord himself was said, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let us deliver him now, if he will have him. St. Matthew twenty-seven forty-two and 43 If any in mockery speak thus to thee, and try to entrap thee in vain words, 
see that after thy master's example thou shalt answer him not. Let thy converse be only with Christ. If thou speak to them, they will not believe. And if thou ask them, they will not answer thee. St. Luke 22, 67, 68. Say to the word, As for me, I have not fainted in following after thee. Lord, thou knowest. Jeremiah 17, 16. Thus spake the woman with the bloody issue, and it was staunched. Though worn out by her long seeking, though full of sickness, still her words were, Lord, I have not fainted in following after thee. Nor shall any faint who, like her, sincerely follow Christ, for he calls the faint and heavy laden to find rest in following him. Matthew 11.28 Let us too follow him, and we shall not faint. The promise to Jacob shall be ours. He shall be in rest and quiet, as well the promise in Isaiah, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40.31 Christ asked, Who touched him? And the woman seems to say, Lord, why askest thou? For thou knowest, the words that pass from my lips are all before thee. Wherefore, I am not ashamed to confess my sins unto thee. Let them be confounded, that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Jeremiah 17.18 In like manner, blessed Peter was not ashamed to say, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. St. Luke 5.8 For he knew that the Lord could read his thoughts. St. Peter, in whom the church and the authority of her discipline was to be established, felt by his deep wisdom and foresaw that nothing could be more profitable for him than that he should not be exalted above measure at the great miracle with which he had been favored. Therefore, he says, depart from me, praying not that Christ should abandon him, but that he should save him from arrogance. And so St. Paul also glories in the thorn in his flesh, given to him lest he should be exalted above measure. Arrogance is an alluring temptation, which even St. Paul dreads, a danger against which even he is specially protected. Even he, I say, for few things could make him arrogant, whose danger arose from the abundance of the revelations. And his rejoicing is that of the perfect warrior of Christ, who gladly purchases his soul's health at the expense of a body wounded by a thorn in the flesh. End of chapter 16 As the virgin must shun arrogance, so must she rise above the world in holiness. Beware, Christian maid, of arrogance. If thou be conscious that divine grace abounds and overflows in thee, still measure thy virtue by the standard of perfection, Give thanks to God and reflect on the infirmities of thy body. So like a ship laden with ballast, thou shalt not be at the mercy of the wind of arrogance amid the threatening waves of this world. The prudent bee is said to poise itself with little stones as a security for its light wings against the uncertain gusts of wind. And as when empty barks on billows float, with sandy ballast sailors trim the boat, so bees bear gravel stones, whose poising weight steers through the whistling winds their steady flight. Virgil. St. Paul and St. Barnabas at Lystra rent their clothes when the people honored them as gods. Do thou, O virgin, beware also, as thou hast the bee for thy example, lest any flattering gale of this world unduly exalt the flight of thy soul's wings. For the soul has wings, according as it is written, who are these that fly as a cloud, and as the doves to their windows? Isaiah 68 It has its spiritual flights whereby, in the twinkling of an eye, it traverses the whole world. The contemplations of the wise are free and unbounded, and the higher they rise heavenwards, the less they are clogged by earthly hindrances. And the soul, cleaving to God and reflecting in itself the divine image, with the passions its fiery coursers, quieted and calm, is borne aloft by the motion of its spiritual wings into the pure ether and looks down upon the world. 
intent on everlasting graces, it escapes the world and rises far above it. Such a grace is righteousness, and righteousness is above the world. Love is above the world. Goodness is above the world. Wisdom is above the world. Yea, though it be in the world, yet it is above the world. Righteousness was above the world when Satan offered all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. He was above the world who would touch nothing that is possessed, even as he said, The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. St. John 14.30 Learn ye too, like your virgin master, though in the world to be above it. And though ye bear about with you a body, let your soul within you wing its flight heavenwards. He that bears God in his body is above the world. We cannot indeed be like God and holy as he is. Let us imitate the apostles, whom the world hated because they were not of the world. Imitate them, be thou a follower of them. Thou thinkest it hard to rise by human virtue above the world, and it is even so. The holy apostles won not this grace by being equal with Christ, but by following him as his disciples. Be thou too, Christian virgin, Christ's disciple, and follow him. Then does he pray for thee, as he prayed for them. Neither pray I, saith our blessed Lord, for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. St. John 17.20 The Lord would have us all one, that we may all be above the world, one in chastity, one in will, one in goodness, one in grace. For by these gifts the wings of the soul are exercised and strengthened. Let us not therefore be idle, but let us rise from earthly things. Our wings will gather strength by exercise. Whatever our soul delights in will aid our flight, so that if it always follow after God and long to dwell in the house of the Lord and feed on joy in Him, and to be nourished by the miracles of virtue which His grace worketh, then will it cast out envy which finds no entrance into the angelic choir. Then will it banish all bodily lusts which may not defile the temple of God. Which temple, since we are, let us renounce all worldly cares. End of chapter 17 The Four Virtues Which Make Harmony in the Virgin Soul Think not that heathen philosophy and poetry supply us with the images which we have referred to the soul. A chariot, wings, and horses, they rather have derived their images from us, and we use our own resources, the language inspired of prophecy. Thus it is written by holy Ezekiel, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also, out of the midst thereof, came the likeness of four living creatures. Consider the description of these four living creatures. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion, on the right side, and they had the face of an ox, on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Ezekiel 1, 1 through 10. Here, too, we have been taught, the soul of man is described. The four living creatures are its fourfold affections, not those untrained passions figured by the four horses in course of discipline and subjugation, see chapter 15, but the affections of the matured and perfect soul. The soul, in the former state, is under probation, with heaven before it as its reward. In the latter, it is in heaven, with the word of God. The four living creatures, which are also appropriate symbols of the books of the Holy Gospels, are here emblems of the purified affections. These affections, as the wise among the Greeks even have defined, are four. 1. Wisdom, or reason, exercising its natural authority wherewith man was endured at his creation. 2. Holy resentment at the sense of wrong, like that wherewith the lion resists aggression, Christian daring and contempt of death. 3. 
desire of what is good, imaged in the calf, which by due discipline grows into temperance, careless of bodily pleasures, absorbed in the contemplation of heavenly mysteries, rejoicing in the bond of sacred charity. 4. The power of discerning right from wrong, justice with its eagle eye, which, raised on its high tribunal, tries and searches all things, unselfish, careful of others' right, the bond of social union. Well does the eagle figure justice, soaring above earth, intent in its sublime elevation on the celestial mystery, it wins for its meed the glory of the resurrection. And so it is written, He maketh thee young and lusty as an eagle. Psalm 103, 5. Hence, it is plain that the holy psalmist also describes the soul as borne up by spiritual wings. And not in this place only, but again he saith, Our soul is escaped even as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. Psalm 124, 6. And elsewhere, in the Lord put I my rest. How say ye, then, to my soul, that she should flee as a bird unto the hill? Psalm 11, 1. The soul, then, is not wholly earthbound. It has its wings, and its wings impart to it freedom, wings, however, not of material substance, but whose feathers are holy deeds arranged in seemly order, like the wing of God, under the shadow whereof thou shalt be our refuge. Especially, indeed, those outstretched arms upon the cross are our sheltering wings, but no less truly every act of holiness is a refreshing shadow of salvation, tempering the burning of a flaming world. Let every Christian, therefore, stir up the grace of God, forgetting what is behind, reaching forth unto those things that are before. Let him press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. Let him forego the honors and contentions of this world, otherwise the fable of Icarus may be verified in him, a fable indeed, but truly teaching and poetic imagery, that they alone, who are ripe in wisdom, can safely fly through this world's atmosphere, while the undisciplined youth, too adventurous and indulgent to his passions, loses the firm compact of his wings by neglect of holy deeds, and forgetful of the maxims of wisdom, falls back to earth and perishes with more fearful destruction than if he had never known the way of truth. And as our flight is perilous, so in the chariot race of this life the passions, our restive coursers, threaten us with danger. If, however, they be duly balanced, the prophet shall again see in us one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures. Ezekiel 1.15 Yea, Ezekiel shall see it, for he is still alive. He sees, he is mighty, and shall live in strength forever. He shall see upon the earth a wheel in the middle of a wheel, gliding without obstacle. Ezekiel 1.16 The wheel upon the earth by the living creatures is in its spiritual meaning the life of the body when brought into harmony with the soul and fashioned in uniform obedience after the evangelic precepts. The wheel in the middle of this outer wheel is an inner life within the former, even as we see that the life of saints is not at variance with itself, the former part thereof agreeing with the latter, and again the life which they shall live forever in heaven being even now begun and involved in their bodily life. When this harmony is brought to pass, then shall the echo of the divine voice be heard. Then, above the firmament, shall appear the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Ezekiel 1.26 This man is the Word. The Word was made flesh. St. John 1.14 And he is the charioteer who subdues our passions. He is our ruler either, according to our several conditions and deserts, as a charioteer, as a teacher on the mount, or as a pilot. But he steers no ship in which there are not apostles to sail, or St. Peter to fish. It is no common ship which is launched out into the deep, St. Luke 5.4. The ship wherein Christ sits and teaches the people is the church, which moves in safety through the world, borne onwards by the outstretched sail of the cross of Christ, filled by the gale of the Holy Spirit. In this ship, St. Peter, now with hook and now with net, is bid to fish, 
O wondrous mystery, he, the spiritual fisherman, is bid to cast the hook of holy doctrine into the sea of this world, that he may take out thence the first martyr Stephen, bearing within him the tribute of Christ, for Christ's martyr is the church's treasure. He was the first lifted from the sea to heaven, caught by Peter to be a minister of the altar, caught not in a net, but by the hook, that alone in his own blood he might be taken up to heaven. In his mouth was the tribute, when in his confession he spake of Christ. For what other treasure can be in us but the word of God? Whoso is more perfect in God's fishermen, both with hook and net, the one surrounds, the other stings. By one multitudes are encircled, by the other man by man is chosen. Would to God that I might be allowed to allow that spiritual hook, which by a rapid sting and slight wound would bring me to salvation. End of chapter 18 The Virgin must, in the communion of St. Peter and the Church, be ready to give up all for Christ. Enter ye, therefore, virgins, the apostles' nets, which are let down not by man's authority, but at the voice of God. The net of spiritual wisdom and doctrine is the kingdom of heaven, which, in our Lord's own words, is like unto a net cast into the sea. St. Matthew 13.47 Today, on this holy festival, the day of St. Peter and St. Paul, ye have heard the Lord's words to Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down the nets for a draught. St. Luke 5, four. Before our Lord thus spake, St. Peter was fishing in the sea indeed, but in the shallows, and here Holy Scripture finds no depth. Where, then, is the deep? First, in the heart of man. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. Proverbs 25. And here there are no shallows. Launch out into the deep, that is, attempt the heart of man with the oars of argument and faith. Thus does our blessed Lord in this place call St. Peter to the church by a parable, even as in St. Matthew, in plain words he saith, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. St. Matthew 4.19 Secondly, in the gospel, for this is another spiritual interpretation, the synagogue was in the shallows. There was no deep water in Judea. So were the Samaritans, and the hidden meaning of the Samaritan woman's question, The well is deep, from whence, then, hast thou that living water to give me? implies that they too were unable to launch out into the deep, even as the Jews were, whose faith they held. Launch out into the deep. The deep is Christ, as is written of the Baptist in the Song of Zechariah. Thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, and height and depth are the same thing. St. Luke one seventy six. Christ is the deep, in whom is the deep of the riches born of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He is depth and height, he exalteth, and is the keeper of him whom he exalts. Where Christ is, there are the deep waters, there is faith that feareth the Lord. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee, and were afraid. Psalm 77, 16. And for the Jews, with them was no deep water, for it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. St. Matthew 15, 8. Christ must dwell in the heart, as is mystically implied in his own words. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. St. Matthew 12, 40. If we continue the interpretation of the Holy Gospel, the explanation just given will appear still more plainly. St. Peter answers our Lord, Master, we have toiled all night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. It was night with Peter before he saw Christ. The day had not yet risen on him. The true light had not yet shone on him. The synagogue is night, the church is day. As St. Paul says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Blessed is that light which hath driven away the darkness of faithlessness, and brought in the day of faith. By it Peter was made day, 
by it Paul was made day, and lo, on the anniversary of their martyrdom, their true birthday, the voice of the Holy Spirit utters the words, One day telleth another. That is, out of the treasure of their heart they preach the faith of Christ, and a blessed day is each, for each hath shed the true light forth on us. Peradventure the colloquy between our Lord and Peter, which the Holy Gospel relates, is held in heaven, even today, with reference to us. Still, daily St. Peter is the fisherman. Still, daily, the Lord saith to him, Launch out into the deep. I seem to myself to hear the apostle saying, Master, we have toiled all night, and have taken nothing. Oh, how few assemble at the vigils and watch by night. St. Peter toils in us, when our devotion is a toil to us. So, too, does holy Paul, whose words ye have heard today, who is weak, and I am not weak. O oh, let not the blessed apostles toil through your lack of devotion. Behold, they say, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Are there any among the rich who fast in the sacred vigils? If not, let them hear St. Peter's words, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. St. Peter 1, 17-19 Gold and silver redeemed you not, but the trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perisheth. It is the study of a faithful slave to repay his master the price for which he was bought. Thy price, virgin, was not gold, it was not silver. Christ bought thee, not with treasure. Be ready with the price, thou ever owest it, though it be not exacted of thee. He paid his blood for thee, thou owest him thine. He paid it for thee, repay it for thyself. We are bound by our sins to a cruel creditor. We had contracted the handwriting of guilt. We had incurred the penalty of blood. The Lord Jesus came and offered his own for us. Thou owest thine, yet canst not pay it. As a faithful slave thou art bound to repay thy master the price he has paid for thee. Thou canst not do it in kind, yet this do. See that thou be not unworthy of the price. Bear thyself, Christian maid, worthy of thy redemption, lest Christ, who hath cleansed thee, who hath redeemed thee, come, and finding thee in thy sins, say, What profit is there in my blood? Psalm 39 What good have I done thee by going down into the pit? For thither, though his flesh saw no corruption, he descended, he descended into hell, into the place of corruption though corruption touch not him who is incorruptible. End of chapter 19 An earnest desire that God's priests, the successors of St. Peter, may gather many virgins into the church's fold. Let us return to the words of our blessed Lord, and pray ye for God's priest, that to him too may be said, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. Who can be God's fishermen? amid the storms and tempests of the world, without God's help. When he so wills, he gives the word, the nets are let down, and a multitude is taken, so great that another ship too is filled. Yea, many churches are filled with the pure people of God. And, when the faithful multiply, God sends more laborers, as St. Peter beckoned to his partners that were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And when thou multipliest thy laborers, O Lord, do thou increase their draught of fishes. Their nets are not their own, they are the apostles. May bands of holy virgins be gathered in their folds, the folds of apostolic instructions. May holy Peter quicken you, O virgins. He interceded for a widow, far more will he for a virgin. Moved by the widow's tears, he raised to life Dorcas, who sustained them. May holy Paul quicken you, who bids honor to be paid to you. It is good, he saith, to abide even as I. He would win you by the honor. He teaches by his authority. He invites you by his example. May he quicken you, 
who left all and followed Christ. So did blessed Peter, so did St. John. How highly advanced was that poor fisherman. He was seeking a livelihood on the sea, and he found the life of all. He quitted his boat and found God. He left his thole and found the word. He loosened his lines and bound fast his faith. He folded up his nets, and he caught men. He despised the sea and earned heaven. While he is tossed on the troubled sea, he founded on a rock men's wavering minds, which till then could find no rest. Let us dwell on his humble craft, that we may the more admire his virtue. Was he an ignoble servant of men, his office as evangelist was more exalted. Was he pinched by poverty, he was the richer in virtue. Was he lowly among men, he was highly esteemed in faith. Is a fisher's good faith mistrusted? He is the more believed, for he spoke not his own words but God's. Was his earthly condition debased? His lack of this world's wisdom was more than compensated by his spiritual wisdom. He, who has not the law, but does by nature the things contained in the law, is himself a law to himself. He, who was unlearned in the law and yet spake above it as Peter did, received his words from him by whom the law itself was given. O great and quickly earned dignity, the poor fishermen bear comparison with Moses the giver and Elias the executor of the law. The virtues of Moses and St. Peter were different, but the grace of God was great in both. To one the knowledge of creation was revealed, the other was great in his ignorance of the world. Moses, by spiritual wisdom, rose above all earthly things, and the height of his world's wisdom, even to heaven. And the soul of this poor fisher, undarkened by clouds and unlimited by time, enters the mysteries of the divine nature. Soaring beyond created matter, he saw the word with God, and saw that the word was God. The veil of flesh weakened not his faith. He acknowledged the Son of God in the form of man, by which mystery the humanity assumed is admitted to the prerogatives of the Godhead which assumed it. Moses, indeed, in saying, And God said, and God made, in the history of the creation, implied the utterance of the Father, and the operation of the Son. But the meaning was sealed, and he alone knew it. And therefore, after the law was given, the people went astray. But now, by the gospel, the truth is at length revealed, and the church believes. End of chapter 20 End of On Virginity, De Virginitate, by St. Ambrose, translated by Albany J. Christie, 1817-1891